And so this morning, the Lord has given me a scripture to preach, um, and we're going to look at several scriptures, but they're going to be rooted in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 4, the beginning of four, verse 4 is where we'll end. And so you can direct your attention to the screens where our awesome tech crew, amen, will have the word of God on the screen for you, or you can pull up your app or your Bible like the good old days when folks actually flipped to the chapter. So whatever suits your fancy, would you please direct your attention now to the word of God as found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord of God, Lord God, Lord of all, I am so blessed by the worship that has happened in this place that has turned our face toward you. I'm so grateful for the prayers of the righteous and how Pastor Kobe has taken us into the very throne room of God on our knees. We bless you, God, for you have said that we can come to you, to your throne of grace and find help in time of need. We come to the throne of grace, individually and collectively, and we kneel ourselves at the foot of the throne, and we ask you to help us, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. Lift us, Lord. Change us, Lord. You are Lord. You get to call the shots in our lives, not we ourselves. We belong to you. And we ask you, Lord God, to establish your lordship more fully in our lives this day through the preaching of your word. Speak, Lord. Hallelujah. Because your children are listening. We're hanging on your every word. You have our full undivided attention. So, Lord God, I thank you in advance that your word never returns to you empty. It always accomplishes what you sent it forth to do. Thank you, God. Just like the rain comes from heaven and waters the earth and brings forth fruit, so your word will produce fruit in our lives today. And we thank you in anticipation of the same in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, amen and amen. Well, last week, if you were blessed to be here at Quest Church, Pastor Aaron uh, preached a sermon uh, where we concluded our My Brave series, and he entitled that sermon, But God. Today, I'd like to preach to you from the theme, Say Yes. And it's because as Pastor Aaron ended his sermon last week, he did something to require a yes from us. And this is where this sermon began getting birthed in my heart for us this week. He had children from the children's ministry and the youth ministry come to church at the end of service last week. Usually the children are having service in one part of our building and those of us who are adults are usually here. But last Sunday he flipped the script and he basically said that many of us, when God calls us to do something, we see our inadequacies, we see our lack of sufficiency and we tell God that we can't do it, that we understand that we should, but God, I'm too old, but God, I'm too young, but God, whatever 
whatever we use to say we're somehow disqualified. But he said, I want you to hear the word of God over you. And because children have a way of, of sensing and believing God in a simple way without all the nuanced questions that adults bring to it, he asked the children just to speak words of, uh, over us on God's behalf. And that we as adults were just to walk down the line and let these little children, little teeny ones, some who would say one word, some who would just smile and wave, whatever was to happen, we were to simply parade ourselves and allow those children to speak or wave or look at us and we were to receive that as a word or a sign from God and we were just to say yes. For those of us who was here, it was a powerful moment. It was an inversion of how we usually do things. And God tends to be upside down. Ten, we think that things are right side up. And God says, let's flip this and show you that unless you become like a little child, you won't be able to see the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. What a powerful time. And so this word got started in me last week because of the blessing of children. Out of the mouth of babes, we were to simply say yes. yes. And now I know something about that simple three-letter word. It takes courage to say yes. It takes courage to say yes to God. And that's exactly what Abram is being asked to do in the scripture I just read for you. Long and short, God is asking Abram and us to say yes. I realized that this was going to be a more difficult text as I struggled with what I was supposed to say to you because I've heard this text since I was a little child. For the time I've been in scripture, I've heard about the calling of Abram and maybe you have too. And I will make you to be a blessing and all the earth will be blessed through you. Unfortunately, I think I spent too much time thinking about the word blessed and you shall be a blessing and you shall get blessed. So I had the misnomer that this text was about being blessed. And I think because many of us want to see God bless us, however we think that should happen, relationally, professionally, monetarily, however we think God should bless us, we tend to gravitate toward texts that seem to promise us that we're going to get blessed. But as I looked at it more carefully and wrestled with what should I say about this call on Abram's life, what new is there to say about it, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. Now, I know some of you got quiet right then because the very notion that God could speak to somebody sounds strange. But I am a living witness that the resurrection is real and our God is not dead. Amen. So I believe God still speaks. So it shouldn't be shocking to hear God speaks to us. In fact, it ought to happen more often. I recommend it to everybody in the room. Hallelujah. Ask God to say something every now and then because God's got plenty to say. And if we believe that the Bible is right and the resurrection is real, then every now and then you ought to hear God say something. Got quiet, but that's a good place right there to say amen. You should. Shouldn't be so strange. So I was praying over, God, what do I say about this text? And how does this connect to, 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 to what I'm supposed to say to Quest? And I heard the Lord say, 11 comes before 12. Now, I know that sounds interesting, and I thought the same thing. But it was a moment where I realized I was studying too hard and focused too hard on the call of Abram, and I never really thought about what came prior to the call of Abram. I was looking so hard at chapter 12 that I did not think of the context of the call. I feel this thing. I didn't think enough about what happened prior to, and you're going to be a blessing. And I'm going to bless you. So I flipped one chapter back. And I said, well, Lord, let's see what is in chapter 11. And I was shocked to discover that the story of the Tower of Babel precedes the call of Abram. I feel like preaching today. So I invite your attention with me now to Genesis chapter 11, 
verses 1 through 9, because in order to understand chapter 12, we must first understand chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinard and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that they were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, nothing, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, at first glance, this story may appear like God is insecure and intimidated by human progress, doesn't it? That somehow it looks like God noticed how ingenious and creative and technologically advanced this people group was, and God got scared. Uh huh. That, that something about that said, oh snap, we can't have that. We can't let people become so intellectually and technologically advanced that they start doing all of this stuff because then there'll be nothing that they can't accomplish. Uh huh. And, 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 and I, I wrestle with that because I can see how we might come to that assumption that somehow God is intimidated and somewhat taken aback by the human progress and skill set that we seem to have as mere mortals. But I hear I'm here to suggest to you that I don't think God is scared of us. I don't believe that God somehow is, is intimidated by human progress and our intellectual prowess somehow threatens God. I don't think that's true. So if that's not what's happening in this text and God is not scared, it makes me say, then how do we understand God's reaction to what seems to be human progress? Uh, I think in order to really understand what really actually is not progress but rebellion, we'd have to go back to the beginning. Uh huh. See how I read the Bible? In order to understand how it works, we can't just cherry pick little scriptures all over the place and, and piece them together and try to make them make sense. Am I helping anybody? Ah, uh, sometimes you need to read the whole Bible and let scripture interpret scripture. Feel like preaching today. And so what was the plan and why does God seem to be upset with those in chapter 11? Why is God's reaction so intense? Well, to answer those questions, we've got to go back to the beginning. And that's how we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. Here's what it says. So God created human beings. Let's start right there. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. 
Now that word subdue does not mean run it, tear it up, use it for your own selfish pleasure. Subdue it means don't tear it up, but bring it under the reign of God. That's what it meant to subdue. Don't destroy it, but bring it under the reign of almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. You who are made in the image of God are supposed to take the image of God throughout the whole earth so that the image of God can be put on full display and as you do that and as you begin to move to the north and the south and the east and the west the whole earth will be brought under the reign of almighty God that was the plan in the beginning and I'm here to tell you the plan was working. God says you're going to go and you're going to literally migrate. Get out of here. Fill the earth. Scatter throughout the entire earth. Some of you will go north. Now watch this. As you go north, you're going to see things and experience climate and environmental conditions that will be unique to going north. And you might need certain types of clothing to cover yourselves because it may be cool there. Ah, but some of you are going to go south. And when you go south, you'll get by water and you'll probably eat more fish and you'll have different types of clothes and you'll need to wear hats to cover yourselves because the sun might be strong for you. Do you see what's beginning to happen as people begin to fill the earth and go from different places? They begin to encounter different environmental conditions and cultural diversity begins to emerge. I'm here to tell you that it was never God's plan that one culture group could somehow represent the fullness of the image of God. It was never God's plan or intention that one little group of people could somehow put God on display. God said, I am way too multifaceted. I am way too brilliant. I am way too awesome, way too glorious. And for everybody to see who I am, you're going to have to fill the earth, diversify, and show the spectrum of who I am. I am that was the plan and everybody said yes Lord yes to your will and to your way we'll do it so they were marching and they were diversifying different foods different languages different songs different stories different clothing different tools for farming different things for fishing Cultural diversity didn't catch God off guard. It was the plan of God from the beginning. It's important for the church to know that. It's important for the church to own that. It's important for the church to claim and declare that. This is not some new politically correct thing. Ah, uh, God meant this thing from the beginning. God intended this from the start and we were doing it. It was beautiful. The image of God was filling the earth and the multifaceted brilliance of God was on display and everybody was saying, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, until they got to chapter 11. <laughs> One chapter sooner. Almost there, but I'm loving you. <laughs> That's why I have to study so much because I didn't see it either. Everybody said yes, but when they got to the Tower of Babel, those people said, no, we will not fill the earth. We don't want to be scattered abroad. Uh-uh. We're going to stay right here. We're not trying to make a name for God. We're trying to make a name for ourselves. So this is no longer about your glory, God. This is no longer about you being elevated. It's no longer about you being on display. This is our show. 
Uh-huh. This is our, we running this one. Everybody is going to see us from far and wide. We're going to put a wall around our city. Heard that anywhere. Uh, we're going to build a wall around our stuff and we're going to keep them out and we're going to keep us in. Uh-huh. Because we are the baddest people group on the planet. All those other nomadic people, they can scatter, but we're staying right here. That's why we're not using stones that can be knocked down. We're going to use bricks and mortar. We staying. And you can't move us. We're going to make a tower that points straight to God to let you know we ain't moving. And God said, ooh, what's going on? <laughs> God was like, let's have a conference call between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> what y'all doing? I, I, I mean, can you imagine the confusion? Like, wait a second. There is a people group who has the audacity to think that this is about them ruling and they resist the will of God. They point their finger in the face of God and defiantly and rebelliously say, rebelliously say, no, you can't make us move. Oh, God says, let's see about that. <laughs> God says, oh, you're going to move, pumpkin. You're going to move. <laughs> oh, I love God. God says, no, you're going to move. So God decides that in the face of this type of rebellion, that in the face of people who have the audacity to believe that they can defy the plan of God, the purpose of God, the will of God, that somehow their image is better and more prominent than the image of God. God says, you got it twisted. You don't get it. You don't understand that I'm the creator and you are the created. So God comes down. Now, when God makes a personal call, there's something going on. God says, let me come down here. Let us go down. Trinitarian convention. <laughs> and God says, we're going to scatter this. So we have a moment where God says, I'm going to give you diversity right here. Since you won't go get diversity and diversify, I'll diversify you. You can't hear him. She can't hear you. Everybody now is going to speak a completely different language. Go. And now they have to move because they can no longer communicate and conspire together to be evil. So God makes them have to talk to other people. God makes them have to move. God makes them get back on mission. That's what's happening in chapter 11. God confuses their language because it was always God's intention that all the families of the earth, not just you two and a few, all the families of the earth were intended to be blessed. Are you hearing me? Y'all understanding over there in the back? I got you. Yes. Now here's important places for us to take this out of the Bible and bring it into real life. Because the truth is, the Tower of Babel is not just a story in the scriptures, it's our story too. And the church said, amen. We hear and see it in the divisive rhetoric that has become so prevalent in our country and around our world right now. It's scary what we're hearing, and more scary is what it's emboldened in people in their actions and their violence. We bow down to the evil temptation of self-idolatry when we seek to make a name for ourselves and we get so homogeneic in our sense of who belongs in and who we keep out that we believe that our strength is so strong that we build militarized walls around ourselves to say to other people, you ain't welcomed here. That's Tower of Babel thinking. Do you hear me? That type of mentality causes us then to say that justice is not justice and liberty for all. It now becomes justice is just for us. Justice, just us. And so every good thing is just for us. Uh huh. That means anything that's worth having belongs to us. That if I want to live here, we're going to stay here because this place was for us us and now that kind of prevalent thinking leads to the horror that we saw in Charlottesville Virginia just yesterday this is not an ancient story this is a real life story 
that type of mentality that somehow justifies violence and rhetoric that divides and builds walls around and keeps people in and tell other people that they're out. That's what leads to white supremacy. And it's that kind of league thinking that started a complete mob riot where people were killed by someone who felt justified in their belief in their supremacy over others to point their finger and say, this belongs to us. And then mow down innocent people in the street who had the nerve to be standing in belief that it was supposed to be liberty and justice for all. Three people killed. 19 people injured, some of them critically, and not sure if they will live or die. We should all be horrified. The Tower of Babel is no light thing. It's no little story in scripture. It's a reality that kills people. God won't suffer it. God won't allow it. As I looked at the stories of what happened yesterday in Charlottesville, I was blessed by my pastor, Eugene Cho, sending an email to all of the team, all of our pastoral team. And he said in his email, I'm praying with you in response to the disgusting demonstration of hatred and racism that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia. I appreciated him so much for calling it for what it was. He didn't try to make light of it. He didn't try to say somebody had a mental disturbance and therefore was unhinged. He said this was racism and hatred on display. And let's call it what it is. This wasn't the act of just one person. There were hundreds of people at this white nationalist rally. And their slogan was, we're going to make America great again. And they had on red caps that said the same. Hundreds of these people who were at what they called the Unite the Right rally made their way to a large park. And David Duke, a former Ku Klux Klan leader who ran for Senate, in the United States of America, the United States, a Ku Klux Klansman could boldly run for office. And he took the stage and he said to the crowd that European Americans are being ethnically cleansed within our own nation. This stuff belongs to us. And then he called Saturday's events the first step toward taking America back again. That is Tower of Babel thinking. That's the way the Tower of Babel sounds in 2017. Do you hear me? God does not bless it. God looks down from heaven and sees that and God says that will not be blessed. I will not condone it. I will scatter that. I will not let that succeed. I am against that. I will not reward that. I don't care what you say and how you try to justify it. That is not God. That's not God. And I want to say to anybody who's in this room who's not a believer in Jesus Christ or you're on the journey of coming to your own faith conclusions, that's absolutely fine. I want to say to you that what you hear people say, when you hear that kind of divisive rhetoric, that's not God. I don't care who says it. I don't care what church they say it in. It's not God. And I don't represent that God. Amen. God asked the people of God to put the image of God on display, and that's not what God looks like. Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. I wish I had a witness. And so God says to wherever the Tower of Babel is, I will scatter you. I will cause you to no longer defame my name and mar my image in the earth. You were supposed to put me on display. Now, now, listen, that is the context at which, in which Abram is asked to come out of this and move. 
go back into saying yes and you stop being with these people who say no. Do you see how brave it would be to have to say yes to God when the Tower of Babel is all around you? I see it. Yesterday I had a phone call with a woman of color who happens to attend this church. And she said to me, Pastor Brenda, those people who went to Charlottesville, Virginia, most of them didn't even live in Charlottesville, Virginia. They came from all over the country to descend on that place. And she said that raises the question, where can I go and be safe when people who don't even live there say that this is my stuff? and feel justified to kill people who were there that they don't like. Where do I go to work and feel that this is my place? Where do I go to church and feel like, see, I'm safe here. Where do I go to the store? Where do I send my children to college? That's what the Tower of Babel does. It causes people to say that this is really just for us and it doesn't belong to you. And God says that's a lie from the pit of hell. And I'm calling my people to move out so that we can get back on what I intended from the beginning. So God begins looking for a new group of people who will say yes. And that's where we come in. God wants this cultural mandate to continue. God wants to move us out of chapter 11 and into chapter 12. And the way we get there is at the very end of chapter 11, we get introduced to a new family, Abram's family, his dad and them. <laughs> Abram's dad's name is Terah. Can I read one more scripture to you? You got appetite for a little bit more word of God? Listen to this. This is interesting. And the Bible says in verse 31 of chapter 11, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot to Haran and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of Abram. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But, somebody say but. But when they came to Haran, what happened? They settled there. Now that's interesting because Terah is Abram's father. He and his family have set out on a journey and their intention is to go to Canaan. That's the plan. That's where they're going to. They're supposed to be going for a destination called Canaan. But somehow when they got to Haran, they decided that that was far enough and they settled there. Now that might look superficial, but it's interesting to me that we don't even understand what made them not go to what they planned to do in the beginning. The Bible doesn't say. It could be that they just got tired and said, this has been hard enough, long enough, let's just stop here. This is good enough. It could be that while they were traveling, uh, they saw the sights and the sounds of Haran, and it was just beautiful there. And they were like, why go further? Let's just stay here. The Bible doesn't say. Maybe, maybe they just were tired. Maybe the kids got fussy. We don't, maybe the real estate prices in Haran were crazy good, and they just, they just decided to buy right now, right while the market was right. We don't know why, but the Bible says that they did not go where they intended to go. They settled. And now I have a question for each and every one of us. Where have we settled? Where did we think we planned to go? Where did we say? What was our goals? And where did we settle instead? Might be worth pondering. Might be worth thinking about. The answer may be different for every single one of us. For somebody, you might say, you know, I started going toward marriage. That was what I intended, but we settled for living together. Maybe for somebody, you might say, you know what? I started and intended discipleship. I really wanted to follow Jesus and deepen my relationship with God, but I got busy on my job, so I settled for church membership. I feel like preaching. This is the kind of stuff we need to say to each other. Because we all know what it is to get to Haran somewhere and for some reason decide to settle. 
For some of us, we were younger and we had dreams of grandeur. We saw ourselves doing great things for God, great things on our job, great things in the world. And somehow or other, something got in the way and life took over and we settled no longer for greatness but mediocrity. It's okay. I can't speak for you. I'll have to wrestle with my own places of where I may have settled. But I'm here to tell you that it is a consequential thing to settle. Don't think that there are not uh, consequences that come when we settle. The truth is the Bible is very instructive about what happens when we settle. It says this about Terah. The very last verse of chapter 11 says, Terah lived 205 years, comma, and he died in Haran. Do you hear what I hear? Yeah. It suggests that where you settle is where you'll die. So be careful where you settle. No matter what excuses or reasons or, or all of those justifications you have for why you settle, be careful where you settle because where you settle, something will die. Dreams will die where you settle. Uh-huh. Relationships will die where you settle. Uh-huh. Creativity will die where you settle. Ah, I'm beginning to hear God say our spiritual vitality will die where we settle be careful where you settle because where you settle is where you'll turn to somebody and say don't settle don't settle don't settle pick your dreams back up again don't you dare settle in Haran but there's good news I feel this thing there's good news I'm not gonna leave you in the place of settling it's a wonderful thing to know that our God comes to the places where we have settled, where he finds Abram right in the middle of Haran. And he says, you may have settled in Haran. Your daddy might have settled, but you don't have to settle. Abram, I'm coming in the middle of your mess to tell you, let's get up from here. You still have a future. You still have a calling. I still got a purpose for your life. Come on, brother. Say yes. Say yes. I've got a will for you. I'm the Lord of your life, and I know where I intend for you to go. All I need you to do is get up from here and say yes. Now, Abram has to make a decision. He's got to decide what his answer is going to be. God says, it's been my intention to find somebody who would know my heart for my image to be on display so that all the families of the earth would be blessed. And Abram, I tell you, if you'll get up out of this place where your people have settled, where your crew has settled, where your family settled, where everybody you know has settled, if you will dare to be different and get up from here, I promise I'll bless you. I promise I'll make a name for you. I promise that through you I will accomplish my will for all the families of the earth to be blessed. What will you say, Abram? I need you to just say yes. yes. And so by faith, Abram says, Sarah, we got to go, baby. We got to go. And she probably said, where are we going? I don't know. How long will it take? Not sure. Do we have enough money for the trip? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, it takes courage to say yes. Because we don't get a GPS when God calls us to leave the places we've settled to get back on mission. We don't get the full 10-year plan and strategic opportunity to speak into it. God just says, I need you to simply trust me. Get up out of the places where your friends have settled, your family has settled, your co-workers have settled. I need you to get up where other church members have settled. Get up from here and take it one faithful step at a time. Just follow me. And I'll reveal the plan as we go. What you say, Abram? Abram said, I'm scared to death. My knees are knocking. My teeth are chattering. But I'm going to say, yes. I'm scared, God. And I wish I had more information. But I'm going to take a chance on Almighty God. And I'm just going to say, yes, I'll do it. Even if I can't explain it, God, I'll say, 
Yes. So my brothers and sisters, before I preach myself crazy in here, God is still looking for people who will say yes. God is still looking for a group of folks who will have the audacity to believe God and get up from the places which we have settled in to follow after the almighty God who still wants to see all the families of the earth be blessed. And so now we come to our point of decision. Whoever's the worship person can come on out. I'm ready to go. And that music helps me get anointed, so. <laughs> what will your answer be, Quest? I have never preached a sermon that I mean more, probably because the urgency of the times in which we live have made me unequivocally serious about every sentence I have said to you today. What will you say? God is asking the question. I'm looking for people in chapter 12 who will start following me and who will stop debating me and who will stop resisting me and who will simply, humbly, vulnerably, bravely say yes. I hear God saying, I still want to bless all the families of the earth. I want immigrants to be blessed. I want people who have money to be blessed. I want people who don't have anything to be blessed. Can I use you so that all the families on the earth can be blessed? Can I use you so that people can see a God who loves and cares and is concerned about them? Quest, God is saying, I'm looking for someone. Will you simply say, yes. God says, can I show people the kingdom of God through you? Can I show people what the kingdom looks like through your friendships, through your social network? Can I reveal myself through you and your neighbors in your community? And your answer should be yes. God is saying, I want people to come to the place that they know the love of God, that they experience what it is to embrace their full God-given identity and step into their destiny. Can I use you to help them see it? And we should say, yes, yes, God. I don't know how you'll do it. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know if I've got enough resources. I don't know what it will mean. But my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. In the little church I grew up in, we used to sing a song and it was simple and it just simply said, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. How you choose to do it, God, may confuse me, but I'll still say yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes. Lord, yes. Quest, in a week we're going to launch a series on discipleship. And I'm here to tell you that that's what discipleship means. It means saying yes to the God who made you. It means saying yes one step at a time. In a world that so desperately needs to see our God on display, I challenge you today to know that our obedience to God, our obedience to God is the primary sign of our discipleship. Did you hear that? Our obedience, say that word, obedience. We can't just think about it, we have got to do it. Our obedience to God is the primary sign of our discipleship. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, don't tell me, show me. Show me what God looks like. And so what will your answer be? Abram said, yes. My prayer is that you'll come to the conclusion that to follow Jesus, for real, for real, is the process of saying one yes after 
the other. What will you say today, saints? If your answer is yes, if you mean, God, I hear you talking to me, and I hear you challenging me, and there are times that I sit silently, but today I stand to my feet, and I declare by my physical presence, yes. For whom anybody who just heard me say that, that is true. And not everybody should stand. But if today you put a, a line in the stand, sand in your spirit and you say, God, I will say yes. I have been afraid, but today I'm sensing a yes all over the building. If that's your testimony and your declaration, I want you to stand to your feet before God with your yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can keep playing. Mm -hmm. Only if you mean it, only if you mean it. God's talking to people on their jobs and it's time to say yes. People are being killed in the streets and we're watching and we need to stand to our feet and decide it'll never happen again on my watch. And it may start at the dining room table and you'll say to somebody at that table, don't ever say that again. Not when I'm sitting here. That's your yes. This is time for the people of God to be the people of God. And we need to declare that we're here. And God, we're reporting for duty. So Lord God, for those of us who have stood to our feet, we say to you, use us. Use us to get us, the church, back on mission. Use us, Lord God, to take us back to the original intention from the beginning that all the families of the earth would be blessed, that cultural diversity would be an expression of the image of God, that the beauty and the splendor of who you are would be on display and people would see our good works and glorify our God in heaven. Come, Holy Spirit, give us strength for the journey, I pray. I pray now in Jesus' name that we would be able to live in such a way that our prayers become reality, that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord God, we give ourselves to that quest that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. May it be so through meager people like us, mere mortals with all of our faults and all of our problems. Use us, Lord God to put your kingdom on display and may it vanquish the evil that is in our land but we ask you to do it in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus and all God's people said together clap your hands people of God and praise him come on somebody give God a standing ovation somebody honor God somebody bless God God is worthy of more than